Hello. And welcome to something totally different. My name is Pondon, and today we're going to talk about map design set to the Thracia soundtrack because I think it's a dope soundtrack. But anyway, um, something that I wanted, I've been thinking about, I've been kicking around this idea for a while, and I wanted to make a video to explain my thoughts on map design. If you know me or you watch any of the videos I make, the thing that I care about most when playing Fire Emblem games or talking about them or designing them is map design. I think map design is the thing that makes Fire Emblem good. I think it's the thing that makes the, like when I play a Fire Emblem game, the thing that gets me most excited about playing it are good maps. Like story, sure, like a good story is great, but if your maps are fun and creative, then I can get really on board with playing and really enjoy the experience. And especially considering in the hacking community, there's a lot of things I noticed that, you know, could be done better with map design, even myself included. Like I'd say it's probably one of my strongest suits as a, as a game designer, but it's not necessarily something that um, we're all expert in. It's the kind of thing that it's a kind of skill that can be built over time and you can continue to get better at it. And so after having made some maps over the course of really the past like year, year and a half or so since kind of diving back into the world of ROM hacking. I put together this framework that I use for myself when I think about like, well, what are the components of good map design? Like what should I be considering when making a map? And when I critique others' maps, what are the things that often come up as, itch as issues? So the purpose of this video today is to talk through this framework called Dagdar because it's got to have a snappy, fire emblemy sort of abbreviation here. So it's Dagdar, and there he is in all of his glory. I love Thracia art. I just love Thracia. If you don't know me, I love Thracia. But it's a great game. But so this is kind of like my framework, my checklist for building maps in Fire Emblem. And it's also a good way just to evaluate maps to see, like, am I hitting all these different components that help make a map good? or not so good. And I think one of the things, kind of the, the pet peeve of mine, is when people say, like, this map is good, this map is bad. And so let's let's put some language behind that, like, what makes it good, what makes it bad. So what are we going to learn today? We're going to understand the theoretical components of making maps. So this is really the components of the, the Dagdar framework. What's required? What are the things that you should be looking at and considering? Like, what's kind of the theory behind, like, well, how do I make sure that this map is fun and engaging for different types of players and play styles? Should be able to build Fire Emblem maps using the Dagdar framework after this. Like this is not something that takes a lot of time to learn. It's just kind of like a good checklist for you to consider as you're going and building maps. And also it can be a good framework to evaluate. You might play a map and be like, this map kind of sucked. And this framework can help you kind of figure out well, what you didn't like about it. Um, it's kind of a good like mental checklist to run through. And my personal favorite, develop vocabulary about what makes a map good and bad. Um, I hear this all the time when people are critiquing, especially in the fan hack community. People are like, oh, this is good, this is bad. And as a creator, that's like the most unhelpful feedback you can get. Um, they're very subjective terms, they don't have a lot of meaning. And so this will help you develop some vocabulary so that when you think something is good, you can really explain why. Why it is good, or if something is bad, you can also explain why this is bad. So without further ado, let's get into the framework. So each letter corresponds to a different element of the Dagdar framework. Let me just take a quick sip of tea here. I love the soundtrack. Okay, D. So a map design framework would not be complete without design. And so when I say design, it really, this is probably the most general overall encompassing term here, but this is the overall look and feel of the map. So it includes not only the aesthetics, but also how well the objective of the map is executed. Every map that you create has a specific objective. Seize, kill boss, route, destroy supplies, escape, arrive, defend, survive, all of these different types of things. The design of your map should be, well, how well does it execute on this idea? So think, so frame yourself or frame your critique or when you're building a map thinking through, I want to have the player achieve this objective. How well is that executed? Like, is it a fun seize map? Is it a slow seize map? Is it a good defend map? Is is there a lot of pressure that's consistent over the 12 turns? Or 
is it are all the enemies gone after eight turns you're kind of slamming the wait button right that's not great execution and that's why right so design is all of these components that go into making sure that your map is executed well as well as that it looks good um it's the most general like touchy-feely look feel execution of the map and this includes things like side objectives right like are the side objectives do they make sense are they executed well are they attainable um so thinking through just like the overall design of the map and this includes other things as well like choke points um and just enemy placement and things like that too that all really compose the package of the map just like the overall like feel like if i'm sketching something out like how close do i to get something to get something that's really enjoyable and a good example of this um it's one of my personal favorite chapter ones um it's the thracia chapter one and one of the things that makes this map i think have good design is if you could see oh you can follow my cursor here that's pretty cool so your units are starting over in this bottom left corner and immediately one of the things about this map that i think especially from the lens of a chapter one that makes it unique is that there are different angles with which to approach the map your starting group is five units you have leaf you have finn you have avel you have haven havan and i'm sorry halvin and orson and you can move them in whichever ways you want you can experiment you could send someone up here you could send someone this way you can figure out who's going to defeat the first soldier that's like somewhere over here and you get three more units you get marty dagdar and tanya over here so you have like eight units to work with out of the gate and that gives you a lot of room to experiment and it also helps set the tone right like this map is village um there's the boss over in the corner so you have to go across but there's different paths you can take to get there and that creates a lot of replayability which we'll get into a bit later so overall when I think about design, just like overall look and feel, does it set the stage right for the conflict? Um, so many different components to consider, depending again on where this map fits into your story, um, how the map looks, how the map feels. I'd say one of the things that's bad about this map is that there's one tile choke points almost everywhere. But for a chapter one, I'm willing to excuse it because again, it's non-linear. You can choose to approach it from different angles. You can use different weapons and items. It's a really good place to experiment um, and get familiar with your units without being railroaded into performing a specific action to move forward, which I think is poor design. So some examples there. There's a lot of different examples you could do. It really depends on like which elements of map design you really care about. Next, the A, anti-turtle incentive. So this is a problem that I see in a lot of maps. And what I mean by anti-turtle incentive is the question of, is there a reason for the player to move quickly through the map and take risks for a reward? So a lot of Fire Emblem maps can be cheesed pretty easily if you just move slowly in a block and kind of whittle your way through the boss, defeating everyone in your path very slowly. Um, but for, I think, a more advanced player, that may not necessarily be as much fun. And you can make pretty much any map winnable by employing this strategy with enough patience. And so anti-turtle incentives, it's the idea of, well, how do I get someone out of their shell, so to speak, you know, remove themselves from this turtling mindset and give them a reason to actually go fast. Um, I think a lot of maps that tend to have flow problems tend to have issues where there's nothing driving the player forward at a pace that creates more quick and engaging gameplay. And if there's no reason to move quickly, um, there's nothing stopping the player from, let me just take this slow and beat the enemies one by one, and I'll make this really easy for myself and not get punished for it and get the same rewards as someone who did play fast and played a little bit riskier. So some examples of anti-turtle incentives, you have classics like brigands going for villages or towns. You have to rush to get to the reward. If you move too slowly, you won't get there in time. Similarly, thieves with chests. Um, you could also do other interesting things like having um, enemies rushing to different points and trying to get to a certain point before they do um, because different events will trigger and things like that. There's a lot of different things you can do for anti-turtle. Um, reinforcements can be a really good anti-turtle incentive depending upon your game. So perhaps having reinforcements that come from behind you that are really scary that you don't want to fight and if you're moving too slowly you get punished for that. So Dream of Five does that a lot. Souls of the Forest does that as well. Um, again, depends on the type of experience you're going for, how appropriate that would be. But these are different ideas for how you can make it so that the player has a clear reward or motive for moving forward. Generally getting items, recruiting certain characters, um, unlocking guidance. These are going to be the types of things that 
will help the player want to move a bit faster through the map. Uh, and I think this is particularly important on route maps where by design you're just killing killing them all. So having a timer on a route map, for example, like you need to move quickly through the map um, if you want to win because you can't just move really slowly. You have to take risks because there's a timer. Stuff like that is pretty cool. Um, another good example, I think, is as I'm thinking about this right now, in Radiant Dawn, um, in part three, chapter, I don't remember the number, but it's Marauders. It's the one where you're in the village and you have to go save the villages from being burned with um, Jeffrey and Kieran and some of the Crimean Knights. Those are some, that's like a good example of anti-turtle because you have to move quickly to save the villages from being burned or else you don't get a reward. So again, that, just different applications of this. And a good example that I always like to point to is probably the strongest map and I think a lot of people's favorite in Fire Emblem 7, Blazing Blade, the Dragon's Gate chapter. So if you're not familiar with this chapter, um, it's a chapter like 21 or 20, depending if you're playing Elliewood or Hector mode, your units start in this space here. And immediately you're present with, with a couple of different choices. So you can go up the path here, you can go up the path here, there's a chest to get over here, there are more chests scattered around. And you have some anti-turtle incentives in that you have a thief that comes out of here who steals these chests and he's like rushing this way to escape. Similarly, you have Lego, who is a thief that you can recruit that comes out of the same point um, about a turn or so later, if I'm not mistaken, or earlier. I don't remember. It's been a while since I've played it. But he also rushes. And you need to chat with him with one of your lords. So you really need to boogie and move quickly up through the map to make sure you get both the thief who has your items and will have a member card, um, but also to get Lego as well. And similarly, there are other chests as well that you want to make sure you also get. So there's a lot of things you need to manage if you're trying to move through the map quickly. Because if you play really slowly and safely, you're going to miss out on some of those rewards. So a really good example of an anti-turtle incentive that helps make the map fun. I guess the other thing as well with this particular example is that there are multiple paths to go through. Like I am rewarded by splitting up my units and maybe stretching myself a little bit thin, which is a bit of a risk. But if I do it well, I can clear out more of the map at once and create a, and carve myself a fast a path a little bit faster to get either to like this point over here to try and intercept the thieves or maybe get them over here to try and intercept them instead. So different options again, but all in all, it's really about making the player move through the map so that they get to this point. And I think when a lot of people say like, this is a good map, I think this is really one of the big reasons why it has a good anti-turtle incentive, which is something that you don't see in a lot of the um, FE7 maps, I would, I would argue. It's a great tune. Next up, gameplay, story, integration. This is the G. Take some tea for a sec. So what is gameplay story integration? This is how well does the map integrate with the narrative? When I'm designing a map, the thing I want to consider is what elements of the story would impact the nature of the map. And sometimes this may mean making a map make a little bit less sense from a pure gameplay standpoint so that it makes more sense from the angle of the story. Um, some examples of good gameplay story integration. When there's events happening in the story that directly influence gameplay and it does so very elegantly or the objectives match kind of what the characters say that they're about to do. Like I think again, Thracia does this really well where you're constantly running away, you're escaping and you really feel like the pressure and the tension from the game that it's giving you, especially in the Master Escape sequence, you're running, you're at a disadvantage, and the game does a really nice job of making you feel like how the how the characters are feeling. If the Master Escape sequence were all route chapters, it wouldn't really make any sense. It's like, why is Leaf, who's trying to escape, spending all of his time killing people and trying to, you know, destroy everyone on the map? It doesn't make any sense. That's like that's poor gameplay story integration. So, having objectives that are aligned to the narrative and what pushes the narrative in the right direction. Um, this could be like having green units that are coming into a certain point. Even like the starting position of enemies, like I think it's always nice when there are situations in a story where maybe the character gets ambushed and you know maybe a bunch of units are starting out right on top of you and it's like, whoa, like they're starting really close to me. This is unusual. But yeah, it makes sense in the context of this narrative because you're being ambushed. I think a more recent example of like this done poorly is the... Um, the Death Knight chapter early on in Three Houses where 
he just walks up and he's like, what's up? And he's right in front of you. And then the map starts and he's like all the way at the other end. And it's like, wait a second. He was right here and he said he wanted to kill us. But he's hiding in this room like kind of far away. It makes zero sense from a gameplay story integration perspective. Um, so yeah, keeping these things in mind as well. And one of my favorite examples of gameplay story integration is chapter four of Fire Emblem 5. Where your units are trapped in jails with no items equipped. Which makes sense, right? They're in jail. They've been they've been imprisoned. And they're being broken out by the Magi Squad who comes out from here. And generally, you probably want to go down here to get your other units. And you're getting their items out of chests and doing a lot of trades to make sure that they have all of their items before working your way back up to escape out of this chamber. So I think it just makes a ton of sense that the map is designed in such a way. And it's really counterintuitive to think like, wow, like I just finished the previous chapter and now my guys are in prison they don't have their items this doesn't make any sense like this is really weird but think about it why would they but why would the guards leave them in cells with their weapons it doesn't make sense i mean yeah like there's some green units here that have axes but like whatever like i don't think they get the axes until the door gets opened if i'm not mistaken you have to gut check me on that but being able to like hey i'm going to retrieve the items out of the chest and then trade them to the person like that's like a much more real scenario than just like, all right, Leaf has his life brand in here. He's ready to go. Like, wait, well, why didn't he just like fight his way out earlier? So good example of like the narrative informing how the gameplay flows um, with this map. And this is really important because it helps, you know, a lot of people, I think when they're making their hacks, they can be very story focused, but then the gameplay just doesn't match up to what's going on in the story. So this is a really important component with considering, um, considering your maps. Difficulty. So with difficulty, this requires a lot of place testing to get right. And difficulty can come from different places. And it's important to consider when creating difficulty that your difficulty comes from places that are fair to the player, but also difficult in that they can be over that can they can be the difficulty can be overcome by smart play, good positioning, and less so on luck or you know, kind of picking the right spot. So, for example, I'd say, like, some of the older ROM hacks that I've played tend to skew by, like, trying to sucker punch the player. And this is things like ambush, re ambush reinforcements. You know, Fire Emblem 6, Fire Emblem Awakening, they have a ton of ambush spawns. And it's kind of just, like, a matter of trial and error to figure out, like, how you're going to get through the map. And it just becomes kind of like, all right, I need to do some trial and error here to get through. And trial and error style difficulty is not great. It's not fun. People want to get through the maps. Generally, if you want to Iron Man, you want to try and get through it on one try without losing anyone. You don't have to reset. You don't want to reset, especially late into a map. And so difficulty should come from places where you're thinking around, okay, how are these enemies positioned? On what turns are they going to be in certain places? What pressure are they putting on me to make certain moves? Do I get rewarded by splitting up my units and putting certain units on one side versus another? Uh, is there an item that I should have gotten if I had moved quickly in the previous chapter that would have made this a bit easier and getting that reward from there? So difficulty should always be fair. It should be transparent. The player should know how difficult the situation is going to be going into it. And that if they make the right moves or perform certain plays or come up with specific strategies, they can overachieve that. And they could plan for the difficulty versus getting sucker punched by you know, maybe taking away the battle preps and not being able to trade or having units being forcibly starting in different places that you couldn't really account for um, that are under leveled and now they're screwed because you didn't level them, for example. Um, so the idea that difficulty should be fair, um, it should come from places where the player has the opportunity to assess the difficulty and make a move accordingly. Like... You don't want to put the player in a position where they're kind of caught off guard and it's like, haha, you lose because no one really likes that. It's a really poor player experience. So a good example of this, I think, is chapter seven from Fire Emblem Six. And the reason this chapter is so difficult is largely due to the design and kind of where your units are. This is probably like the first really hard map and a really easy one to get screwed up on because there's just a lot going on. Your units start out in this kind of bottom center area that's pretty open, probably the most open of any maps that you've faced at this point. There's a ton of villages you want to visit, 
um, quickly. You have some green units here with Zealot and Trek who are fighting over here and they're quickly overwhelmed. So you want to move up here, but there's enemies coming from this side. There are Wyverns who are pretty buff. But the thing about this map that makes it fair is that there's nothing happening immediately that is unfair to the player. Even the reinforcements that come, they give you plenty of notice because they're probably if you're moving through the map at a fair pace, you have plenty of turns to react to them and decide what you want to do versus, you know, reinforcements coming from behind you on turn two as an ambush and units are right here and you can get screwed without really having had a chance to react to that difficulty. So this chapter, if you plan well, it can go over really, really great. But if you don't, um, it can be tricky to try and discern. So you really have to think through how you want to go about this map, how you want to position your units, calculating the damage output so that you can move through the map at a certain place and your positioning really matters. Do I position and stay in the forest? Do I try to shove everyone over to one side? Do I split and try and take on two different um, fronts at once? Different angles to approach um, as well help make, I think, the difficulty um, more fun and easy to overcome. So I think this map gets cited as one of people's favorites. And I think that's a big reason why is that it's difficult, it's challenging, but it's also fair. It lays it out for you. Hey, this is what the map has to offer. This is what the map's going to do to you. This is now you have to figure out, well, how do I overcome that? So that's my take on difficulty. Um, so in short, do not freaking do ambush spawns. Don't, don't put the player in situations where they you know, have to reset because you sucker punch them. Don't take away options that they've presumed to have, like removing the convoy or things like that without being very explicit as to why or finding some other alternative solution. So some ideas to, to make your maps have the right level of difficulty. And enemy placement is really paramount in this, right? Like if you have like a bunch of enemies up front that you can't feasibly over, you know, fight in one round, or like there are too many enemies that can kill you at once. Like you have to rethink how you're placing your enemies around so that it is a little bit more achievable. So consider that as well. Consider the strength of your units versus the strength of the enemies. How many enemies should they be facing each turn? Because um, if you give them too many enemies to face off against, they're probably going to be overwhelmed and it's going to just kind of be like slam weight and heal on player phase. And that's not really the fun type of difficulty either. So balancing out where you place your enemies also influences this very heavily. And you'll find, and this has been a theme already, is that all of these are very much interrelated, but different angles with which they are related. I'm going to take a sip of tea before I get into this one. Action. So, action is the idea of every turn, is there a meaningful decision to be made? I think a lot of people really dislike when maps have long gaps where you're not doing anything or turns where there's only like one enemy moving or you have to like move all of your units up like the max range and hit wait because there's like such a huge gap between you and the next enemy. Action is about making every turn matter, making there some sort of interesting decision to have to make each and every turn so that the player stays engaged with your map and doesn't like go into autopilot because it's too easy or because there's just not enough stuff for them to do. Action comes from where you're placing your enemies, how frequently they are within your range to attack or can attack you, having villages or other side objectives to complete, the space with which your units occupy. Like if you're putting everyone through like a conga line, a one tile choke, it's not really a meaningful decision you seem to keep like funneling through this one tile passageway and there's really not much else it can do that's not very engaging or, or thought provoking. Um, so having meaningful decisions to make. Do I put my unit here or do I put them there? Do I take out this unit first or that unit first? Do I make this call to put myself at risk of taking more damage and potentially dying so that I can reach the village before the brigand gets there? These are meaningful decisions that define action throughout the map. And I think a really good example of this and pardon the crappy map is Conquest Chapter 10. I think this gets cited very frequently as people's favorite defend chapters across all Fire Emblem games. And a big reason why is that you have meaningful decisions to make every single turn. Every unit has to make specific moves. They have to really think about where they're going to be because you need every single person in your army. Not a single deployment slot is wasted to make sure that you're covering different points to make sure that 
this part that you're defending up here doesn't get breached. You have multiple points to protect. You want to move forward as well. There's a lot of push and pull on this map. There are villages to get, there are enemies to defeat. There's a lot of action. And that's what makes this map really engaging, challenging, and also, I think for a lot of people, really a lot of fun. So again, when you're considering action, think of through where, how many enemies am I going to place on the map and where are they going to be placed? Um, how are they in relation to my anti-turtle incentives? How are they, um, how many units does the player get to deploy and where are they being deployed from? Um, is like the pacing with which the, I'm expecting the player to move match up with what the enemies are going to look like all the way through the end of the map? All important things to consider when when considering action and you'll find that like the maps that you probably enjoy the most are the ones that have a lot of great action throughout each and every turn and this is really hard to do especially through like the end of maps or towards like the middle late game of your hack where you can't necessarily account for units scaling maybe as much for example and having like one unit steamroll and then it kind of becomes a snooze fest like that's something that's hard to harder to account for especially if you're new to designing a rom hack or kind of trying to figure out how to build something in the traditional fe formula but you can generally try and think through is there something meaningful for my units to do each and every turn and if you're play testing and find that like all right i defeated all these enemies and if there's nothing for me to do i may as well just like move the max range towards the boss and I don't get punished for doing so, there's nothing else happening, that's low action, that's not really that great. And then, lastly, the R and Dagdar, replayability. So, one thing that I think a lot of early maps do poorly is they offer very limited replayability. And what I mean by replayability is are there other ways that I can approach the map to achieve my objective? Replayability comes from a lot of different places. And I think depending on like whether you're like a new or older Fire Emblem fan, your definition of like ideal replayability might be different. So for example, I feel like a game like Fire Emblem 6 offers the player replayability by giving you such a huge cast of units to work with that each run can look different because you have different units. A game like Three Houses, for example, offers replayability by giving you a ton of reclassing options. So I can run Felix as a Dark Bishop or as a Myrmidon or whatever, um, and changing that up. On a map level, replayability, I think, is around multiple paths. Are there different strategies I could have employed to, to win the map sooner? Are there different ways I could have approached it? Um, Sometimes this is about having like separate events or triggers depending on like a choice that you make mid-map, like a route split, which I would not advise in a ROM hack project unless you're super serious because it just kills a lot of things. But having replayability in your maps, especially where there's more than like one linear path and one very clear cut best option. So like think through like, like the prologue of FE8, I think is like a pretty good example of a map with really bad replayability in that there's three enemies on the map, and basically it's like, I either throw Seth at them, or I throw Erica at them, and they die. And that's like all there is to offer. Not really that exciting. Um, maps that are super linear tend to have poor replayability. Maybe there's only one path to the boss. Um, maybe it's just like a really open field route map, and you kind of just like need to like move in a certain way to get things done, right? A good example for me of replayability comes from Fire Emblem 8. And this is Turning Traitor. I think this is chapter 10 or 11 in Ephraim's story. And what I love about this chapter, and one of the things that always gets me looking forward to playing it, is that it offers replayability from a couple different angles. Um, one, there are different ways you can approach the map. Um, you can decide to defeat the boss. You can decide to run out the clock. So there's different approaches to succeeding on the objective. You have to recruit Cormag. And that can be really tricky depending on which way he flies. You could try fly skipping to get to the boss over here. You have to recruit these green units and you want to try and beat your time to try and save all of them. For example, different approaches to your map help encourage replayability um, as well. So there's a couple of things to, to unpack here. On your map specifically, multiple paths, multiple options with which to get to the boss. And that can be influenced by the units 
that the player has available or certain items that they can use. Generally, replayability just comes from more broadly giving the player options to work with that are meaningful and that have certain pros and cons that may work in certain situations better than others. But again, it offers that sense of, all right, I can try this again differently and achieve a same result, not a better one. And that to me is really fun. Like I like going back to older Fire Emblem games and thinking through, all right, well, this map would be really cool if I used like three flyers. Maybe I should try training up three flyers next time because there's this path of water here and maybe I can do like a triangle attack to defeat the boss on turn one. Something like that. Something stupid. But it could also be a question of, um, man, this map, for example, maybe it has like a lot of high attack units. Maybe I wish I would use an armor knight over here instead. Or maybe I can warp an armor knight to plug this hole um, so that this way this is choked and I can move through this map faster. Different ideas. I'm kind of just spitballing here. I didn't script out any of this. I'm just kind of talking through the, the general ideas that I have here on replayability. So that's pretty much everything I had to share today on, on the Dagdar framework. I hope this is helpful. Um, I certainly find it useful for myself and whenever I'm designing a map, I always want to consider these things, um, especially when I'm not sure like what's missing. It gives me a good sense of would this map be something that has good design, does it look and feel good? Is there something driving the player forward or punishing them for not moving forward? Does it tie well into the story and help reinforce the narrative that I'm trying to tell and make something more unique and interesting because it's impacted by the story? Is it difficult but fair? Is there a meaningful decision for the player to make on every single turn? And are there different ways I could approach this that would be interesting and most importantly worth exploring on a second playthrough or a third playthrough? So I hope this video is helpful and informative to everyone. I had a lot of fun putting this together and making it. I'm sure people will laugh that I made this in PowerPoint and there's no visuals or animations, but this is how I roll. I'm doing it off the cuff. We're doing it live. So thank you again for watching. My name is Pondon and enjoy mapping. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to hit me up on Discord or leave them in the comments. Until next time, guys, I will see you then.